evening, I should say. Happy uh, 2022. Am I, how long do I have to be able to still say that and be cool, Dr. Brown? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say it every, every meeting moving forward. Uh, we'll call this meeting of our Board of Education for LBSD to order. I'm gonna ask our student school board member, Sydney, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Sydney, and we'll give you a chance to formally introduce yourself uh, in a bit. We welcome those that are here for the purposes of addressing the board at the proper time and in the order of their request. If you wish to speak during the meeting, please fill out a form. I have a stack here in front of us uh, indicating your name and the agenda item that you wish to address. You may also request to give testimony on an item not listed for discussion today. However, full discussion on any items not listed on the agenda will have to be delayed until such time as the item can be publicly posted in advance as a regular agenda item. If you wish to ask questions, please address them to the chair and not to any individual members of the board or staff. The board has been meeting in closed session today regarding matters listed on today's closed session agenda and wishes to report that no reportable items were taken. No reportable actions uh, were taken. So we do have public hearing item today. Item 9.1 on our agenda, public hearing on a resolution of the Governing Board of Education of Long Beach Unified School District to convey a property interest for public street purposes to the California Department of Transportation for the construction of pedestrian and bicyclist safety improvements. Uh, my understanding is that we don't have anyone here to speak on behalf of that item, Thisa? Okay. So, uh, Brent, rather than moving through, is it okay for me to just close the item at, at this point? Okay. So we have no public testimony on that item, so the item is closed. Um, call for agenda items for separate action and adoption of the agenda as posted. Do we have a motion? Move for approval. Second. Any discussion? We'll do a roll call vote. We'll start with uh, Board Member Miller. Aye. Ms. Kerr. Aye. Ms. Craighead. Aye. Mr. Otto. Aye. I also vote aye, so that passes 5-0. Next item is approval of our minutes. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? A roll call vote. Mr. Miller? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Mr. Otto? Abstain. And I vote aye, so that passes 4-0 with one abstention. And now we have the distinct pleasure of introducing our school board, student school board member from Lakewood High School, Sydney Gooding. How are you today, Sydney? Getting you. It's exciting out here today, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Cars honking, people chanting. Yeah. Feels good to be a school board member today. <laughs> um, hello again, my name is Sydney Gooding. I am the ASB student body president at Lakewood High School. Um, today, the student body, teachers, and staff distribute at-home COVID tests. Students were instructed to take both today, take tests both today and Sunday, and if they test positive, they are encouraged to stay home. We are taking extreme measures at our school, ensuring that our student staff are safe, safe at campus and wearing their mask. We are also hosting a variety of activities for students to participate in and are having, and are having a good time while staying safe. In February, we are hosting a Black History Month rally, a dodgeball tournament, and also selling Valentine's Day grams. In March, we're hosting a Sadie's, Hawkins Dance, and a March Madness Week tournament. Um, these are just a few of our activities that the student body is hosting for the next few months to come. Um, our student body works hard for all students at Lakewood High School by hosting many activities and recognizing for their academic achievements. Thank you, Sydney. Nice job. Um, it's customary for us to ask our school board, student school board members, what their plans are after graduation. So what are your plans? 
um, I applied for Brown, Columbia, UCLA, UCI, and UC San Diego. Do you want any uh, advice or suggestions on where you should go <laughs> to, to be, uh, to, what, what would you like to study, Sydney? Um, biology or like the history of medicine. Ooh, nice. Very nice. Uh, so I'm a firm believer that you end up where you're supposed to be uh, at your, in your college experience. So best of luck with picking the best option <laughs> for yourself. Thank you. I'll open it up to my colleagues if they have any questions or comments. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. That other school is welcome to make their pitch right now. <laughs> oh, so while that is one of your options, is is there a dream school? Is there something that you're really hoping to do, or somewhere you're going, hoping to go? Brown. Nice. Why Brown? Um, because of the open curriculum and being able to do different things and explore diff other options. So I want to, other than medicine, I want to explore architecture and urban design planning. Now I have to kill her. <laughs> so I studied architecture as well. So it's, it, it's an interesting field to say the least. So uh, I wish you good luck in that. Thank you. Best of luck, Sydney, and thank you for being here today. You did a great job. We know it's a school night, so if you have to excuse yourself, we totally understand. Okay. You got a shout out to Oh, do you have someone here? Yeah, I didn't even see. Wait, now, and now you're up. Now you are up. You cannot hide. Anyone in our audience today that you want to give a special shout out to, Sydney? Mr. Booth. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you, Sydney. So next item on our agenda is recognition and acknowledgement, student, staff, and school celebrations. Mr. Ritson, cue us up. My first name is Ruth. I am a first generation Egyptian American. My parents came here when they were older and they had to start their lives all over. And my dad, he worked his way up from a security guard to be a doctor. And I really want to make him proud and I work hard and I do all these things so that all their works and all their efforts were not in vain. Outside of academics, I really love to sing and play guitar and piano. I just do that all day. I really love to paint when I have the time to. And I know this is kind of nerdy, but I kind of do research on like ALD and different neurological diseases that affect children. I want to be a neurologist when I grow up. He's seeing my dad be a doctor and I would always ask him questions about his work and it's always been something that has really interested me. I also love to teach. I am currently a piano teacher and I lead Sunday school at my church while facilitating and running two clubs at Millican. Teaching someone how to do certain things makes you reflect on yourself, reflect on your failures, reflect on your weaknesses and your strengths and use all of that to better someone else. I'm really thankful that I was able to land in LBUSD. I think it's just truly a perfect program for new students, introverted students, extroverted students. Transitioning from being help to helping others has been probably the biggest thing in my um, experience here. That was wonderful. Transitioning from being help to helping others. I love that. Um, thank you for that, Mr. Edson, for putting that together. Uh, we will move on to our public testimonies on items listed on the agenda. Can we start with our first speaker, Mr. Suarez? Hi, Hi Mariela. My Good evening. Uh, my name is Mariela Salgado. Uh, parks, I serve as a Parks Commissioner, more importantly, a parent of two. Uh, today, I want to speak to you on item 22, the superintendent's report. A few months ago in October, as a parent, I was elated to hear Dr. Baker say that there was funds for enrichment programs for any school to access. Over the last few months, I've tried to get our school and two school sites that I serve, one in West and one in East Long Beach, to get some of these funds for extracurricular acti activities. Um, Unfortunately, I have not been able to have any success on that, so I would like to ask uh, the board to 
and the superintendent to hopefully give an update in the next meeting where we um, know that school sites are getting that additional funding and um, that a lot of these resources are being communicated to schools. As the district leaves more and more money and programming in the hands of school site leaders, it is crucial that parents and school site councils and ELACs function effectively, that we know that these resources are being used. What I do know is that, for example, at my school site and the other school site, we, I was able to get, through grant funding, two robotics classes for fourth graders. But unfortunately, I have no teacher to hold on to to uh, partake in that activity. So these are the types of programs I would love to see in schools, and I'm hoping that you all pay attention to that to ensure that school sites are getting the funding and that I'm not spending lots of hours volunteering to try to fundraise. Um, please spend some time at board meetings sharing what the district is doing to ensure equity across school sites and accountability for program implementation. Um, what is the district doing to monitor these funds and school site, school site councils to use these types of funds at the school site discretion? Um, I have as a parent of two, to me, um, at a time when kids are having a hard time, parents are having a hard time, we're all having a hard time. Um, I really think that these types of enrichment programs make are, are invaluable to our schools, and I hope that you will keep an eye on it and that um, in the upcoming board meeting, we will have some progress in regards to these funds and school sites and the information being relayed at the school site level. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mariela. Mariela, just if you could, you got about 29 seconds. So um, thank you for your participation in the school sites. And yes, we have been reiterating for parents to be involved at the school site level because there are obviously funds there, discretionary funds. Uh, so I, I will ask our superintendent and or some of our executive staff to, you know, reiterate the importance of that, but also give us a status update on those funds. So thank you, Mariela. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Hi, Kim. Welcome. Good evening. Hi. Good evening, board members, Superintendent Baker, Deputy Superintendent Brown, and other staff. Happy New Year, as this is the first board meeting for 2022. And I'm wishing you, you and your family, a year of connectedness and sustained joy. So many of you know me, but for the parents watching this meeting, I am Dr. Kim Tabari, a parent of a Long Beach High School young man, and I am providing comments as it moderately relates to item 20.3 around the hate motivated behavior. And this is a policy that's committed to inclusion, safe and safe environment, one that's free from discrimination. And so I wanna tie it to the budget cycle from last year where you all committed funds to developing a black student achievement initiative with the goal of providing additional academic, social, emotional and other support for black students. The district also committed to developing and engaging an advisory committee to help with these recommendations. I am currently a member of that committee representing BLM Long Beach with the goal of improving academics for black students in the district where 70% are failing math and English. So just 30% meeting or exceeding academic standards. This is the first time ever that a group of black mothers, fathers, caregivers, teachers, staff, and community members have been brought together to talk specifically about black student achievement. That in itself is a win for 2021. So since there's no guarantee that this program will continue beyond this year, it is vital that the board ensure that funding is available beyond this year for this work to continue. It would be a shame for LBUSD black students to miss out on this year's original investment of $750,000. We must continue to press forward for our black students and ensure they receive equitable investments and programs that last for many years. So again, this initial investment must, of $750,000 must not be allowed to dwindle uninvested from a group that is overrepresented in negative academic indicators and disproportionately interacts with school safety and the criminal justice system. So I'm calling on you to do a couple of things. Develop a list of five to 10 clear academic, socio-emotional and other learning supports. Invest in the LCAP funds to target black students. 
with tutoring, et cetera, and ensure that those students, teachers, staff in, the, in that affinity group have some sort of black student achievement symposium created to hear from black students and their families and share resources. So thank you for your time and your attention to this matter. I look forward to hearing any updates on this initiative. Thank you, Dr. Tavari. Mr. Suarez, did we have any other speakers for items on the agenda? Uh, that's it for items on. Okay, so we'll move to items not listed uh, on the agenda. Okay. Good okay. evening. Welcome, Gilbert. Hello, Dr. Benitez. Uh, thank you, President Benitez, uh, board members, executive staff. My name is Gilbert Benia. I'm, I'm here to speak on behalf of CSCA. I'm the CSCA president for Long Beach Chapter 2. LBSD, give us our raise. We appreciate your endless videos of gratitude. Your love gives us a thrill, but your love don't pay our bills. Our low wages are not getting it, uh, cutting it, cutting it to take care of our families. Your words are full of meaning, but your actions are empty and it shows at our doorsteps every month in our current pay stubs. Our parents, students, and classified workers are suffering. We classified employees are hardworking and devoted employees who show up to work even though our current working conditions have doubled and our bodies keep giving us warning signs of exhaustion, stress, restless nights thinking about our loved ones. Superintendent Baker, you had said, and I quote, I have come to know and love LBUSD after working for 28 years here. First as a teacher, then as a school principal and central office administrator. We classified employees are part of that LBUSD that you have come to love and have been there supporting you along the way. As you are aware, one cannot function without the others. The universe is speaking to us. Your love give me such a thrill But your love don't pay my bills I need more LBSD, give us our raise. Give us our raise. Give us our raise. Thank you. Thank you, Gilbert. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. Is it Sergio? Ah, uh, yeah, it's me, Sergio, again. So, anyways, I'm the vice president of the CSEA. So, I'm here regarding the negotiations meetings. Um, there is non nothing happening again. So, I just wanted to tell you guys that um, we have uh, a stalemate. Uh, your lead negotiator is first he blamed you guys, which is the board and now he's blaming the executive board. And so, I mean, who's left the janitor? I, I, I don't get it. So, I mean, something has to happen. You guys have to give him some kind of authority because I find it really special that, the, uh, that you guys, for instance, can give a 14% raise to the subs and nothing to us. And then uh, the executive board, uh, this happened a long time ago. You guys got between 13 and 16 percent raise. So it leads me to believe that, that something is amiss. You know, we, we, uh, we're asking for our 7 percent raise. Uh, like I told you, I already broke it down once. You know, we, we are entitled to 5.0 per, uh, 7 percent. So that means less than 2 percent of a raise for us. Uh, right now, 
the schools are suffering. Um, I had to take care of the front office all by myself because uh, there's nobody there. We have like over two to 300 students per school out and that's not including the teachers. Uh, there's no subs out there. So you guys know as well as I do, they have you guys going out there. So we're getting worked to death and then we're waiting years to get our raise. And so uh, we need somebody that can negotiate. We need competent people. I mean, uh, if, if you guys are looking to hire an attorney, we need a, a competent attorney. It was kind of weird what the stuff that he says. You know, uh, we have what they call 610, and that's uh, where we go and we have to um, go to CSEA and make sure everything is legal, and then we have to go in front of our constituents and then get voted on. He said that you guys have the same thing here. That doesn't make any sense at all. The other thing that I'm really having difficulty is, is there's a hiring freeze here at the school district and there's supposed to be over 400 jobs opening. Uh, how do you have a hiring freeze and have 400 uh, openings? It, it, it's not logical. Uh, I, wanted to, did, I do want to tell you a little bit while I have 22 seconds left. Uh, we went to Catalina Island and uh, the custodian there is working three jobs. He's working 12 hour shifts. And so he's his own boss because you guys don't have anybody out there. Anyways, I know that a 5.33% COLA is in the year for 22-23, so we're not going to accept any less. Thank you, Sergio. Your Thank time you. is up. Um, Hi, good evening. Good, good evening. My name is Leila Lamar. I am a senior on varsity at Wilson High School. So first I wanna start off by saying I am a firm believer in gender equality, more specifically transgender and non-binary rights. In fact, my friends and I host a podcast in which we discuss these issues and how they relate to those communities. I would be happy to welcome transgender and non-binary athletes into any locker room that I use. With that being said, I have spoken to my swim team about the possibility of a co-ed locker room and we simply do not feel comfortable sharing a locker room with the boys swim team. The proposal of a co-ed locker room will inevitably threaten the comfort, privacy and safety of Wilson athletes. Most girls do not feel comfortable changing in front of each other, let alone a group of teenage boys. As a senior, I've had my fair share of awkward swim practice and locker room experiences, but I cannot imagine my embarrassment if it were witnessed in front of a team of teenage boys. There should never be an instance where people are obligated to change in the same room of the opposite sex with no say in the matter. Beyond that, as my coach Katie Rowe has pointed out, there is, we need adequate space to change into our tech suits. This is a difficult and often painful experience or painful process that requires a lot of space in the locker room. As someone who has been putting on tech suits since I was 10 years old, I know that doing this within a bathroom stall is not practical or even possible. There is simply not enough room for two people in a stall to accomplish this. The proposal will inevitably create a divide between athletes and strained relationships within teams. Thank you so much for this opportuni opportunity and have a great night. Thank you, Leila. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, board members. Good I'm evening, Enrique, Enrique Chavez, the Long Beach Unified CSEA Unit A VP. Um, here again, board members, to let you know that your lead negotiator can't find who to blame anymore in our negotiating sessions. First, he blamed you guys, the board. In our last session, he blamed the executive office. Uh, Steve, we asked Steve, 
Can you ask the board members what is the lowest monetary offer they would be willing to give classified employees? We're asking for twenty-two fifty retention slash hazard pay. LF, LA Unified gave twenty-five hundred to their employees to return. Yet, I don't know if he did come back and let you guys know. He promised he would. That's a question that you guys can answer tonight to yourselves. Again. Just to let you know how bad it's gotten when we negotiate with their lead negotiator, we asked for medical grade hand sanitizer, what you guys gave to the teachers in the return to work MOU. His response was no. When we inquired as to why we cannot get medical grade hand sanitizer, he said we don't need it in the middle of a pandemic. So as you can see, negotiating and coming to the table and saying no to everything, that's not negotiating, that's dictating. Again, uh, board members, let's, let's put this question on for tonight. If classified walks out or they decide to strike, who in the executive staff is going to get the blame? Because the tensions are running high with classified employees. They feel that they're overworked and underpaid and understaffed. Again, board members, classified they want their raise that the governor gave the governor gave a 5.07 they want the 5.07 and again we're aware that the governor is going to give a 22 for the 22 23 school year a 5.33 cola raise so again how long will classify wait to get a decent wage again board members three seats are up for election please listen to your classified employees do you want a walkout or a strike on your record? If you are pro-labor, why are you permitting contracting out? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Hi, good evening. Good evening. My name is Karen Foote. I am a 30-year uh, employee of the school district and a resident of Long Beach. I am an instructional aide in special education. And just giving you a bit of history of the staffing shortage that we are currently experiencing, I believe it has, with the instructional aides, it, the shortage has been um, caused by the district. Over the years, the district, every time an aide separates from the district who has medical benefits, the district takes that job, cuts it into two jobs with no benefits, and has not raised the, the compensation enough for our you know, for people to want to work these jobs that are only 3.8 hours a day. And with, you know, the inflation rate at nearly 7% and the district only offering a 2% ongoing, that equals out for me about one tank of gas for my car each month. And that, you know, I believe you can do much better than that. <laughs> so, and how does that, the staffing shortage has, the, yes, the pandemic has exacerbated it, but how is it affecting our students? Our students are not being taken to classes if they have multiple classes that they might need an escort for. Our aides do not have the time to take care of um, if kids need extra help with their schoolwork. There's no time to do that because we're basically, the instructional part of our job has been wiped out. There's not enough people. So, you know, we basically are caregivers. We're making sure they get their meals or making sure they get to the bathroom. There's always a need that they have that is not related to instruction. So we're really not doing instruction anymore, which is really sad for our students. So I believe that the district can do much better. They can hire people, you know, 
for the appropriate, appropriate amount of hours that our kids need them for, and to pay, they need to return to paying medical benefits to make these jobs worth having and keeping. So I think the district needs to take a serious look at what we want in our compensation. We need our 7%. Thank you. Your time Thank is you. up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Good evening, Viola May. Good evening. My name is Viola May Bledsoe. I've been an instructional aide with the district for 30 years. 2017, my rent was $500. 2018, it went up to $700. I've since had to move um, the end of last year. My rent is now $1,200. I make under $3,000. Of course, that's take home, not before taxes. That's an awful lot to go up in that short a time. And by the way, this is just for a room in somebody's house. This is not for an apartment. A room in somebody's house that I share bathroom and share the rest of the house with the family or another roommate. Not having a raise in that amount of time, everything else has gone up. My cell phone bill has gone up. My car insurance for a 19-year-old car went up to almost $900. I have never had a ticket nor an accident. It doesn't leave me a whole lot of wiggle room to do anything in with anymore. Then you got work. Because you want to keep having 3.8 hour aids, we don't get anybody, we don't get subs, we don't have people coming in to apply for the jobs because it's not a living wage. And so the aids that are there, we are so overworked it's not even funny. I was in a classroom the other day with nine students five of which are considered runners, which means can get up and bolt at any time, and a wheelchair upstairs, which means I have to use the elevator to do the wheelchair. I get pulled out halfway through the class to go s take care of two other students in another class. We are being pulled left and right Class after class, we never know where we're going to be because there's not, and I know this is not just from COVID either. This was starting to happen before COVID with not having enough substitutes. And I know you guys are facing that also with the teachers, but your instructional aides are working themselves to death. You've got so many of them out with injuries and some of them are not going to be able to come back from the injuries. Really, you guys really need to think about giving in on this raise and treating us with the respect that we deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Hello. Hello, LBUSD board members. My name is Lily Palmer, and I am a student at Millican High School representing the Long Beach Green Schools campaign. I would like to start today by thanking LBUSD for your work to support environmental educations and solutions through programs such as those by Ground Education, which create educational activities around sustainability using school gardens. We would also like to thank the LBUSD board for working towards sustainability and off fossil fuels, as 30% of our energy is provided by solar. Today I'm going to speak to you about the importance of transitioning off fossil fuels to prevent a future pandemic and to improve conditions for current generations and generations to come. As I'm sure you're aware, COVID-19 is one of the highest concerns for students, parents, and teachers at the moment, especially with the new variant, Omicron, 
we are all concerned for our safety and are looking for ways to guarantee it, whether that be masking, social distancing, or just staying home. Those of us in the Green Schools campaign are considering an additional approach to reducing the risk of contracting COVID-19, and that is reducing the pollution in the air by converting to clean energy. Smog and air pollution have been shown to exacerbate the impact of COVID-19, particularly by causing those pre-existing conditions known to increase the mortality rate, such as asthma, diabetes, and high blood pressure. These are worrying facts, especially for Long Beach residents as we live very close to the port. The pollution caused by the port is bad enough and certainly does not need to be worsened by our school system. I've lived in Long Beach my whole life and asthma runs in my family. Reducing pollution in the city is incredibly important for the health of my community in general, but especially now during a global pandemic. Please consider the proposal to convert LBUSD to 100% clean energy for our health and yours. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi, good evening. Uh, hi, my name is Matthew. Um, I'm a sophomore at Long Beach Poly High School. I wanted to thank you all first for allowing us to come to speak to you today about a topic that I consider to be of utmost importance, and I hope that you all share that sentiment with me. Um, in keeping with the theme of today, I wanted to talk a little bit about air pollution and how it pertains to COVID-19. According to recent studies, increased concentration of air pollutants has the potential to increase COVID-19 cases by as much as 4%. While 4% might not seem like a lot, in a county with over 31,000 new cases every day, 4% is over 1,500 people. And that's only half the story. New evidence from a Harvard School of Public Health uh, study has found that even the most minimal increases in the level of particulate matter can increase COVID mortality rates by 9 to 10%. Not to mention, respiratory illnesses like bronchitis and asthma, instigated and exacerbated by air pollution, are significant risk factors for COVID-19. Now, according to a recent release by the district, LBSD is engaged in a, quote, ongoing effort to keep students, staff, and families safe during this current regional surge in COVID-19 cases. And I believe you when you say this, but we have to remember that a large part of keeping students and families safe is ensuring that the air that we breathe is clean, that it's not contributing to respiratory or um, cardiovascular disease, and that it's not worsening caseloads or symptoms of COVID-19. The virus is scary enough as it is. Just coming to school, seeing a quarter of my class gone, entire tables absence, it's really disheartening. And knowing that my friends, their family members, or my teachers might be at high risk for getting severely ill if they do contract the virus is a horrifying experience. Why compound it by pouring um, harmful pollutants into the air? That's why I ask that you don't betray the trust that we as students put in you to keep us safe, that you accept the resolution that we set forth to transfer LBSD away from fossil fuels. For the sake of our health in the midst of a in the midst of a public health crisis, I ask that you consider our proposition seriously because it is ours and our families' lives that are on the line. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Um, so, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Rodriguez. I'm currently a junior at CAMS High School, and I'm a member of the Long Beach Green Schools campaign. Um, I'm here today to continue the, to spread the message with my fellow members that they shared before me, uh, to speak on transitioning off fossil fuels and how important it is to me. Especially with the current situation of the COVID-19 pandemic and rising Omicron cases, previously, Matthew shared how this pandemic pandemic has greatly impacted our world, especially fellow youth my age. I'd like to thank the Long Beach Board for working to improve ventilation in our classrooms, which is of great importance currently while maintaining safety to battle the highly transmittable Omicron. It is well known that minority groups such as racial minorities and low income communities are impacted disproportionately by particle pollution and as a result have much higher rates of asthma and respiratory illness. Black and Latin ch children have double the asthma rates as white children, and according to the Oxford Cardiovascular Research Centers, 15% of the worldwide deaths from COVID-19 may be linked to chronic exposure to air pollution. Additionally, researchers found a 49% increase in the COVID-19 death rates in our communities. <coughs> Sorry. 
increase in the COVID-19 death rates in counties and elevated fine particle pollution and that had been in higher black population. Time and time again, scientists warn us about the dangerous impacts of particle pollution and the stress they pose on our respiratory systems. With a 710 and 405 interchange and around 13 refineries lining the edge of the west side, this creates a perfect storm of CO2 and nitrogen dioxide onto a majority Hispanic, black, Asian, and low income population. And sure enough, the more densely populated area of the west side and Wrigley area saw higher rates of COVID and much higher rates of COVID mortali mortality rates. Sorry, the, These Long, Long Beach citizens' lives lost due to the same type of fossil fuels we use and every minute we rely on our energy source that pollutes a dirty air into our community, more lives will be lost. These fossil fuels we spend increasingly more on our budget and also contribute to global climate change on global warming. I, your student, urge you to continue your efforts towards a cleaner, healthier, and greener Long Beach and to make sure the next step to transition off of fossil fuels for good. Um, thank you so much, and I hope you guys have a good night. Thank you thank for you. having me. Thank you. Okay. Hi, good evening. Hello, good evening, everyone. My name is Isabella Villa Quintero. Um, as a 10th grader at Poly High School, it has come to my attention, especially with rising COVID-19 cases, that climate change takes a large role in our world. Recently, studies have shown directly linked impacts from climate change to COVID-19 deaths. With temperatures constantly rising, species head and closer to the poles to escape the heat. This means animals are coming in contact with species they would not normally interact with creating new opportunities for pathogens to get new hosts. In addition, the World Resources Institute has revealed only 15% of the planet's forests remain intact, and the UN reported that the quantity of species has already dropped 20%, and it continues to decrease at a dangerous rate. Multiple mammals are facing extinction, causing, causing smaller organisms like rodents, which are better adapted to humans, to grow in population and easily transmit diseases to humans. The burning of fossil fuels also impacts the number of deaths because of particle pollution. Pollutants such as nitrogen dioxide and ozone caused by refineries and traffic directly contribute to COVID-19 death rates. This has shown to affect minority low-income communities. Growing up, I have seen the struggles faced by all sorts of people worldwide, whether it's during COVID-19 or not. My family has been fortunate enough to take me on trips so that I can experience how others live. Sadly, most of these locations I visit struggle with environmental issues. It is our responsibility for the sake of incoming generations, for our population now, for our earth. We need to take action now and transition off of fossil fuels to prevent further climate damage. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Eduardo Dominguez, and I am an 11th grade Technology Pathways student ambassador and also uh, swim for Wilson High School. I'm here today to talk about the co-ed locker rooms being built for the summer of 2023 at Wilson High School. Co-ed locker rooms, if you're unfamiliar with them, are locker rooms where both male and female students will be sharing the same locker room. Although this will be, these locker rooms will be beneficial to students who have a privacy concern, uh, irrespective of their gender identity. Building a co-ed locker room would have more negative impact on students of any age, grade, or gender. Uh, these locker rooms would open the doors to things like sexual harassment, assault, and discomfort at school. Now I know that there are students who find it hard to speak up when something happens. So if something were to happen to these students, they will keep this to themselves and continue to be uncomfortable at school. Their learning environment would be abrupted, which realistically can lead to an unhealthy mental and physical state. In late October of 2021, just a few months ago, uh, a Virginia juvenile court judge ruled a transgender teen guilty of sexually assaulting a female classmate in a co-ed locker room at Loudoun County High School. And apparently this teenager uh, was accused of two separate incidents at different uh, Loudoun County high schools. And I think this is just perfect evidence of what kind of risk we put our friends, our classmates, and our kids in when building a co-ed locker room. Um, as well as a uh, co-ed locker room opening the doors to things like sexual harassment and uncomfortability at school, this can also lead to students being falsely accused of doing something they didn't take a part of. 
And as a current 11th grade student athlete, I know very well that high school students can tend to be very immature and take actions without thinking about the consequences. So I would also take into consideration how students are feeling. Um, I've heard from both my club and high school swim teammates that they would not be comfortable uh, changing in the same locker room, nor would they be comfortable knowing that their younger sibling would have to do the same thing in the future if they went to Wilson High School. Uh, I also read about how these locker rooms would have more individual changing stalls, uh, which would be more of a safety concern for uh, co-ed locker rooms. So I think it would be a better idea instead of building co-ed locker rooms with uh, individual changing stalls to just improve the locker rooms we have right now, both female and male locker rooms, and just add these individual changing stalls to each one so that students who have a privacy concern have the choice to change inside these individual changing stalls or in the main locker room. But generally speaking, uh, constructing these co-ed locker rooms is going to create a much more negative than positive environment for students at Wilson High School because of the quantity of incidents that could occur in these locker rooms. So please consider how the majority of students are feeling about having a locker room. I know the district is trying to do what's best for the students, so consider what will be, what will be of most, bene most benefit to students. Um, thank you all for your time. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Good evening. My name is Denise Frank. I'm a college educated and have a master's of science in special education, currently working as an IAS special for Millican High School. I invite the school board to recognize IAS's meaningful contribution toward education equity that contributes to the national and international outstanding reputation Long Beach Unified School District claims. Many of the IAS employees at Millican High School are willing to forego insurance benefits if allowed to maintain additional and consistent employment hours beyond the 3.8 hours a day and the 20 hours a week. Although insurance benefits are desirable and the cost of living increases, uh, cost of living increases essential, why is it unreasonable to provide the vetted IAS employees um, I'm sorry, vetted IAS employees who maintain positive work evaluations and consistent employment the opportunity to sustain a 30-hour work week. Using the district's reliable staff members assures Long Beach Unified students to receive their mandated services and un un uninterrupted opportunity to progress in their ability to become compassionate, lifelong learners, capable of achieving their personal goals as self-sufficient, responsible, and contributing citizens for a diverse community, which is the mission state statement for Long Beach Unified School District. The IAS staff are vital professional employees, fundamental for, to the maturing of Millican students, individually and collectively. We strive to uphold Long Beach Unified School District's reputation that secures students, that secures students to receive an equitable and equal education. Millican IAS, uh, IAS um, staff request for the school boards to consider immediately stopping the practice of outsourcing our jobs by hiring third party agencies to fill the hourly positions. Allow IAS employees to occupy daily or vacant positions throughout the district. Use current staff members to reduce the district's need to advertise vacant positions. Waive the 3.8 hour workday and provide a 30 hour work week if we agree to waive our insurance. And eliminate the raise. Giving me more and giving us more hours per day is more cost effective than a raise. Please appreciate the enthusiastic and committed IAS paraprofessionals are integral to the collaborative team that supports teachers, districts, and administrators. Three minutes Thank, you. Thank you. So colleagues, Leticia has informed me that our 30 minutes for non-agenda items are up. We only have three comments left, so I'd like to hear the three comments if you all are okay with it. So Mr. Suarez, can we bring in the last three speaker speakers? 
Good evening. Good evening, you guys. Scott Rice, Wilson High School graduate, 1985. I'm here to speak about the non-gender bathrooms and showers and change rooms in the new swim facilities. I see some of you are paying attention. Seems you're not getting the right information about the problems with the facilities and the dangers Mr. Rice, to kids. Could you have your, leave your mask on, please? So you can hear me. There you go. Seems you're not getting the right information about the problems with the facilities and the dangers to the kids because honest voices are being quashed. I'm a master swimmer and have seen numerous gyms and swim facilities, domestic and internationally. I've never seen a non-gender change room at colleges, public facilities, or even paid membership gyms. USC, Santa Monica, Loyola Marymount, none of these guys have non-gender changing gyms. If these things are essential, why don't these public facilities have them? I'll tell you why, because they're unnecessary. There are better, simpler, and safer solutions. The gentleman before me, before me, two before me, actually gave them to you. I learned about this pool facility was designed with traditional changing rooms, but somewhere along the line it was changed. Yet nobody will tell me who ordered the change. I've contacted PDK architecture firm, but they won't reply to me. This made me want to learn more. Jill Baker supplied me with a fall PowerPoint. It, it tries very hard to legitimize a bad project design and a bad agenda. I sent the facility schematics up to USA Swimming. The head swim coach, who was an Olympian, said, and I quote, this is ludicrous and dangerous for kids. I've contacted teachers, coaches, who've all expressed real safety concerns, and parents are mortified. My first government call was to my local council person. She won't speak with me about the subject. I learned she was told to shut up and stay in her lane. And that statement, I'm told, came from the mayor's office or the school board. Which is it? I actually visited Wilson High School this week and they told me this is a disaster in the making, but please don't use my name. It seems to be a running theme where everyone is scared of retaliation from the school board and the mayor's office. A government that shuts down debate by way of intimidation is a government that is rotten. Whoever told the city council to keep quiet knows the project is bad. They know the people won't go for it, and, but yet you guys are hell bent on pushing this harmful agenda. These people who did this need to be called out and removed from government. Finally, I've only had a couple weeks to do some research, but what I've learned so far is not good. The functionality of the facility is poor. The true safety for the kids is abysmal, and the intimidation by government to disquash dissent is extremely strong. We need to, hold this, to put a hold on this project and get real input and not dictates from a woke group. I'm for the safety of the kids and I'm for creating solutions, and I know the solutions, but they do not include non-gender, universal showers, or changing rooms. Thank you for your time. Thank you. No, no, you're fine. Hi, I'm Tracy Myers, a uh, licensed California architect. I'm here to continue my discussions with you guys about these co-ed locker rooms. And um, I want to start with the California Department of Education. I recently heard from them and their responsibility is to enforce Title V. And there are provisions within Title V that talk about needing to comply with local jurisdictional requirements designed to meet federal state statutory requirements for structure fire and public safety. Um, there's also a section under 14030 that says shower locker areas are to be of sufficient size to allow students enrolled in PE to shower and dress each period. We already know that with 10 showers for boys and girls, there's no way that that can happen. Um, and then I just really wanna say to you guys, I, I gave you this chart, there's some questions on this chart. Who is driving this? You know, you guys have heard a lot of really impassioned and thoughtful and intelligent critique of this design. I've brought up safety issues relating to the code, um, and I'm gonna be filing a complaint with the State California Architects Board next week because I have not heard from any of you. I've not heard from the architect. I've not heard from the district. I, what's the deal here? You know, I just, I've been very measured here, but I'm getting very frustrated. You are serving the community in the city of Long Beach. And I don't think you're doing the right thing. You're just not being responsive to the community's concerns. 
Um, you know, Long Beach Unified School District claims that review and, you know, that they talked with stakeholders, they talked with people who are going to be using this facility. But you've heard today from two students who don't want it. You've heard from coaches that don't want it. And I'm not an invested party. I don't have children. But, you know, I love swimming. I love Wilson. I don't have anything to lose. All of these other people have something to lose, their livelihood. You know, and I don't understand what's going on. I'm very discouraged. I'm frustrated. And I'm frankly appalled. You know, I can't believe that I have to go to the state architecture board to talk about code violations when I've brought this up to you all. Numer this is my third time. So I, I, I don't know what's going on. Um, I'm a little upset right now. But, you know, I'm taking the next step. And I'm doing something I hope to not have to do and to file a complaint against the district's architect. You know, so they're going to be forced to respond in writing about these code issues because that has not been something that any one of you have been willing to compel. So anyway, that's all I have to say. I appreciate you looking at my documents, which were emailed to you earlier. And um, I think it's fair for us to want to know, when are you going to respond? We need a response. It's time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Suarez, this should be our last uh, speaker. Good evening. Okay. Hello, I come to you um, again. I've been here, coming here since August as a Long Beach resident, a former parent of a Long Beach Unified School District um, student. Can you just put your mask over your nose, please? It's, thank, thank you. It's the way it is. Thank you. <clears throat> and a teacher in the district for almost 12 years now. <clears throat> I understand coming here is equivalent to basically talking to a wall. We've been sharing research over and over and over with you guys about masks and the harm that they do and, um, and all of the other things that have been going on in this district. Um, but I, I came here specifically knowing that and, um, and I'm okay with that at this point. Um, what's happened with me is that you guys have now changed the mask rule and so basically you people are now and, and the world and I'm happy the world is finally admitting that masks don't work so that's fantastic the solution to that is not to step it up and force people to wear other types of masks um, so again I had to go and do some research I've been asking you guys to bring me research to let me know um, that potentially I'm wrong but nobody's brought any research back to me I'm tired of hearing we're just following the health department orders when the health department has done nothing but offer um, Choices. Ms. Sampson, I'm going to ask you again to please put the mask over it, your nose. It, it, it is. You're, you're holding it and you're bringing I'm it down. I'm holding it so I can talk and it's not sucking into my mouth. <clears throat> All right. And so <clears throat> do I get my time back when you're interrupting me? Because it kind of interrupts my train of thought. Well, if you take <clears throat> your mask off again, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. So please leave your mask on. All right. So on. everything the health department has been telling us is... Um, has been actually diminishing our immune system rather than strengthening it. They're not telling us to eat healthy or to exercise and to get lots of sunshine. So I've been sadly attacked by my principal verbally and um, some colleagues for sharing scientific research. I'm a science teacher. So the education system is trying to silence me. I've had a paper put in my file that um, says that I'm not allowed, you know, restricting me from, from sharing scientific research, which it's very interesting to live in this type of a world that we're living in right now. So now what I've done is I've gone back to do some more research on um, the long-term use of these N95 and the surgical masks, and they cause all kinds of damage um, to people. Teachers are speaking all the time, and so we're going to be exposed to high levels of carbon dioxide, which is very damaging. Um, I brought research for you guys here. One of it is showing how it's the... Um, Choroidal changes, so the oxygen that travels to your eyes is being restricted and you could actually have eye damage um, done. Um, heart rate, thermal stress, and subjective sensations is another problem that also is happening. Um, adverse effects to healthcare professionals is headaches, which is very common, which I've heard from many people. Skin breakouts, rashes, acnes, impaired cognition, um, and then also voice differences, so people are speaking louder than they, than they feel like 
because they have the mask on, which can cause irreversible damage to your throat. So the fact that you're now admitting to us, thank you very much and thank you the rest of the world, that masks, regular masks do not work and that we've been suffering for two years with these masks, the solution is not to step it up to a different type of mask and cause more harm by lack of oxygen. Um, thank you, your yep, time is up. Thank you. Serena Sampson. Okay, just a couple of things that um, I wanna make sure that we clarify. Um, I know that folks uh, have come in and spoke to us um, about our negotiations with CSCA. We are in active negotiations, including a mediated, mediated fact-finding process. So because of that, we cannot comment, whether it be school board members and or our executive staff, on those negotiations. So just matter of public record, it's not that uh, we're not responsive and we're not listening. We just can't comment because of the mediated fact finding. Uh, additionally, um, our superintendent confirmed, made me aware, I should say, that we are not currently in a hiring freeze. As a matter of fact, it's the complete opposite. Uh, we are actively uh, hiring and recruiting. And I mean, I see job announcements almost daily. Uh, so wanted just to clarify that uh, we are actively recruiting classified employees in many, many categories. I'm just going to use it as a chance to plug. If you're interested, check out our website. There's plenty of job opportunities available uh, to us. Uh, that being said, I also wanted to make sure to thank all of our speakers that came out uh, tonight. Uh, a few of our speakers from time to time thank us for giving them the time. It's the opposite. Uh, it is your uh, civic right. This is your meeting. This is a community meeting. This is civic engagement. So not only do we encourage uh, for you to come out and provide public testimony, but it is your right uh, to do so. Uh, but it is also our right to make sure that we um, uphold the protocols, procedures, and safety measures that we have in place. So uh, that is why I'm often reminding speakers to please uh, continue following our safety protocols. But thank you for everyone that came out uh, tonight. Dr. Baker, did you wanna add anything on the two points of clarification? Okay, thank you. So we're going to move on to staff report. We have none tonight. Business items, certificated personnel report, Mr. Miller. All right, thank you, Dr. Benitez. I present the following proposed actions prepared by the Assistant Superintendent of Human Resource Services, approved and recommended by the superintendent. For certificated personnel, for appointments, we have 54. In service changes, we have 82. Leaves of absence, we have three. Resignations, we have five. And retirements, we have seven. That's the report for certificated personnel. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Take a roll call vote, Mr. Miller? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. And I also vote aye, so that passes 5-0. Classified personnel report. Once again, I present the following proposed actions prepared by the Assistant Superintendent of Human Resource Services, approved and recommended by the superintendent. For classified and exempt personnel, appointments, we have 176. Leaves of absence, <coughs> we have 10. Terminations, we have one. Abandonments, we have two. Resignations, we have 29. Retirements, we have 11. And amendments, we have four. That's for classified and exempt personnel. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Uh, actually, I'll do a, the plug again. If you're interested in applying for our uh, jobs, lbschools.net forward slash jobs. Yes, Mr. Itson, I think that was the website you gave me. Uh, so again, we are actively hiring. Thank you, Mr. Itson. Um, any other discussion? Let's do our roll call vote. Mr. Miller? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. And I also vote aye, so that passes 5-0. Instruction report. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Do a roll call vote. Mr. Miller? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. And I also vote aye, so that passes 5-0. Finance report A. Move approval. Second. Uh, any discussion? Do a roll call. Mr. Miller? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. And I also vote aye, so that passes 
Finance Report B. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Yes, Dr. Benitez, I recuse myself from participation in Finance Report B on the consent calendar. I have a potential financial interest under Government Code 1091 and 87100. My husband works for a subcontractor who has done work for the payees. Thank you, Ms. Kerr. Any further discussion? Do a roll call vote. Mr. Miller? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. And I also vote aye, so that passes 4-0 with one abstention. Business Department Report. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Uh, yes. I would like to thank the Ohana Office Products for donating $10,000 to Browning for a recreation center and sustainable garden. Um, also, there was a 4000 well, nearly $4,000 uh, donation to Cleveland from Square One Art. And then also, um, we will be investing $500,000 in musical instruments over this next year. And so I'm very proud uh, to be a part of a district that puts such value in the arts. Thank you, Ms. Craighead. It, and it was um, wonderful that we continued much of our choruses, our music programs, even if they had to be done virtually, especially during our holiday uh, performances. So uh, much appreciated. Uh, any other discussion? Okay, let's do our roll call vote. Mr. Miller. Aye. Ms. Kerr. Aye. Ms. Craighead. Aye. Mr. Otto. Aye. And I also vote aye. So that passes 5-0. Purchasing and contracts report. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Let's do a roll call. Mr. Miller. Aye. Ms. Kerr. Aye. Ms. Craighead. Aye. Mr. Otto. Aye. And I also vote aye. So that passes 5-0. So we have a few items other, under other items, superintendent items. We'll start with 18.1 Williams UCP quarterly report. Sure, this item is a standard report for the second quarter of Williams and it resolves, it, it recognizes one resolved complaint in the area of instructional materials. Thank you. Do we have a motion? Do you need a motion? Or is it it's information. Information, Thank sorry, you. okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Um, 18.2, student discipline. Thank you. I have two recommendations for expulsion this evening. We'll take them one at a time. Um, the first is I'm recommending expulsion of student number 731. This student would be expelled under Education Codes 48915C2 and would not be eligible to apply for readmission until after June 15, 2022. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Let's do our roll call vote. Mr. Miller? Aye. Ms. Kirk? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. And I also vote aye, so that first one passes 5-0. Second is student number 876. This student would be expelled under Education Codes 48915C1 and would not be eligible to apply for readmission until after June 15, 2022. We have a motion. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Mr. Miller, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Kirk? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. I also vote aye. So that second one passes 5-0, Dr. Baker. Um, administrative assignments. Thank you. I have one administrative assignment rec recommendation tonight for Jenny Acosta. To, to move from program administrator at Head Start to the acting director of Head Start. And just to be clear, I wanna thank Ms. DaCosta for stepping in temporarily while Ms. Diggs is out recovering from a minor injury. Indeed. Motion? Move approval. Second. Discussion? Mr. Miller, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. And I also vote aye. So that also passes 5-0. Unfinished business, we have none. Uh, new business, we have a few updated uh, board policies here. Mr. Zay, do you wanna, I'm sorry, did, did you wanna uh, just give us a quick background on each of these three and then we'll vote for each of them separately since we have three 
uh, I believe, just updated, revised policies here. Absolutely. So um, let's so start with board policy uh, 5131.2, bullying. Sure. So I'll, I can give an overview of all three? Perfect. Okay. So the board policies are periodically reviewed to ensure that they're updated to reflect their recent legislation uh, or changes in the law. Um, changes that you will see in these three policies are updates to the non-discrimination language. Mm -hmm. For our bullying policy and our um, immigration enforcement uh, policy, we added our Title IX coordinator uh, and as well as the new role of the equity compliance officer to both of those. Just as a reminder, these compliance and coordinator roles support the, the district in ensuring compliance with not only uh, federal and state laws and regulations, but also with ensuring um, that all of our district sites and our programs are free from discrimination, harassment, intimidation, and or bullying. Um, when we do the updates, we utilize the California School Boards Association sample uh, policies. And so what you'll see tonight in two of our policies are the updates with the new roles. And then in our hate motivated uh, behavior uh, school board policy, you'll see a new introduction, the definition of hate motivated behavior, uh, age appropriate instruction, staff training, and also uh, new complaint procedures that are part of those updates. Thank you, Mr. Zaid. So I'll ask my colleagues, let's take these one at a time. Can um, we have a motion for our bullying board policy? Move approval. Second. Second. Any discussion? Yeah, I just wanted to point out that if anyone's, so you talked about, Mr. Zaid, the, the changes that have been made that on the agenda, if you click on it, you can see um, mm -hmm. the current language, the strikeouts, mm -hmm. as well as the new policy as it, if it's approved, is approved tonight. So for for folks who are wondering about what some of those changes actually look like, both of those documents are available on the agenda. Mm -hmm. And again, these are updates to existing policies. These are not new. Yes. Um, any other discussion? Okay, Mr. Miller, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. And I also vote aye. So board policy 5131.2 passes 5-0. We'll move on to board policy 5145.13, response to immigration enforcement. Do we have a motion? Move approval. Second. Any discussion on that one? Mr. Miller, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. I also vote aye, so that policy passes 5-0. We move on to board policy 5145.9, hate motivated behavior. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Mr. Miller, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. I also vote aye. So that passes 5-0. I changed my tone there, huh, Mr. Miller? Threw you, you off. You, you did. It did throw me <laughs> off a little bit. It's okay. Just trying to mix it up here. <laughs> um, okay. Our next item is item 20.4, resolution number 011922-A, uh, resolution of the Governing Board of Education of Long Beach Unified School District of Los Angeles County ordering a governing board member primary election, setting forth the specifications of election order and requesting consolidation of such elections with the primary nominating municipal elections to be held on June 7th, 2022 in the city of Long Beach. How about that? We have an election uh, right around the corner. So um, Ms. Takahashi, could you give us just a little background on this? I think Mr. North is prepared to okay. speak to the Sorry, side. that's right. Sorry about that, Mr. Takahashi. Mr. North, sure, here we well, are again, Brent. Election time. Here we are again. It's, it's the cycle that never ends. And it's a good thing, right? Re renewed hope, renewed vision, and renewed uh, voice. So this resolution calls for the county to consolidate our elections with the city's elections. It's one of the many ways that we try to save money by making certain that our elections are held along with other elections and that way we get to share costs. So holding it on June 7th will harmonize with the city's election, with the county's elections, and, uh, uh, and will also be in line with the city's municipal code, which calls for the election to be held on that date. 
Thank you, Brent. And it also sets forth the filing in March uh, as well, correct? It does. Any uh, questions or comments, colleagues? Thank you, Brent. We need a motion. So moved. Second. Mr. I'm sorry, any further discussion? Mr. Miller, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. And I also vote aye. So that passes 5-0. So I guess uh, we have three seats uh, up on our school board this election cycle. Next item is resolution 019, I'm sorry, 01192-B authorizing our chief business and financial officer to compensate board member Otto for an absence at last board meeting. Uh, Mr. Otto was out uh, ill at last meeting, so we just need a motion here to give him an excused paid absence. Move approval. Second. You can only do that once, Mr. Otto, okay? Uh, <laughs> I was gonna vote on it. <laughs> I remember this happened to me, I think my first year, and I was like trying to figure out what do I do? Uh, here. Uh, any discussion? Okay. Uh, Mr. Miller, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Uh, is Mr. Otto allowed to vote on this, Mr. North? I'm going to abstain. Okay. And so I vote aye, so that passes 4 0 with one abstention. Thank you. Uh, next item, resolution number 011922 C, a resolution excuse me, of the Governing Board of Education of the Long Beach Unified School District to convey property interest for public street purposes to the California Department of Transportation for the construction of pedestrian and bicyclist safety improvements. Move approval. Second. Uh, did, did, you, did you have a, okay. Mr. Miranda, can you give us some background on this item, please? And provide a few highlights. Mm -hmm. Uh, so for school districts to convey property to another public agency, they're required to follow the process in Education Code Section 17556. Basically requires a number of actions. That includes uh, first adopting a resolution of intent, which took place on December 1st by this board. Uh, circulation of a notice of a public hearing, which we did um, accomplish with staff efforts. Holding a public hearing, which took place earlier this evening. And finally, adoption of a resolution to grant the proposed conveyance, which is what we have before us this evening. Uh, the actual property in question here, or, or up for discussion, is a very small piece of property. It's actually 46 square feet in total, and it's at the corner of Cedar and PCH, uh, closest to our EPHS school site. Um, the, the specific area at that corner right now is cr currently uh, there's a planner uh, or a small little flower bed within that area. Uh, so it, it's really small, really underutilized is what I would say. Um, however, approval of this resolution and this property conveyance would really allow Caltrans to proceed with a number of pedestrian based improvements that includes some traffic signal upgrades, uh, push button upgrades, audible sensors and signals as well. Um, and ramps, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention the ramps as well, right? So just in terms of uh, accessibility um, pathways. Uh, just as my last point of reference here, uh, if you read through the materials and actual conveyance documents, you'll see many references to, to the term easement. So just want to reference and, and highlight the fact that this is in fact a property conveyance. Uh, easement is really just a term used in the law uh, that we're required to, to utilize here. Thank you, Mr. Miranda. Any uh, questions or thoughts, colleagues? So basically standard operating procedure here, Mr. Miranda. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, do we have a motion? Move for approval. Did we already? Okay, oh, we sorry. Already so oh. uh, any other discussion? Okay, so let's take a roll call vote. Mr. Miller? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Ms. Craighead? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. And I also vote aye, so that passes 5-0. Report of board members. Why don't we start with Ms. Craighead tonight? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I've noticed a theme of service this evening, starting with our Millican student being highlighted. Um, she comes from uh, a family that immigrated from Egypt, and I, I really liked it when she said, uh, going from being helped to being one that helps others. And 
I thought that was very poignant. And also on Monday, we celebrated Martin Luther King um, Jr. Day, and that's always a day of service. And so it's to continue this theme, I'd like to encourage everyone um, in the spirit of service to be vigilant. And so I'm asking uh, families, if your child is sick, if your child is showing symptoms, keep them home. Because we all know that times are very tough right now and that it's putting extra pressure on us. We know we have lots of uh, kids, families, teachers, school staff that are sick and missing school. And we are not the only industry that's suffering in this pandemic. If you read papers, I still read a paper, uh, most, <laughs> most people are on some kind of social media or watch news, and you'll hear about other industries being affected, flights being canceled, not enough pilots or flight attendants. Um, we have supply chain issues because people are sick and suffering. So let's do what we can to help each other out, uh, protect each other, and get through this. And so I'm just asking in the spirit of service that we do this. And then we can have a healthier new year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Craighead. Mr. Otto. Well, happy New Year to everyone. Happy uh, 2022. Um, <clears throat> my voice has been kind of given out on me today, so I won't be long. But uh, I'd just like to say that it's been a very tough couple of weeks for the Long Beach Unified School District because of uh, the pandemic and people's anxiety about coming back to, to uh, school in the school district. There have been so many things that have gone on in terms of how to keep our students safe, how to keep our schools open, how to make people feel good about this great school district and all the work that it does that uh, I'm beginning to see, I think, that people are starting to say, okay, we can get through this. We've gotten through the first couple of weeks and uh, I am so proud of the staff, the teachers, the parents, uh, and everybody that's involved with what we do here, which is to try and educate our, our, our kids. And, uh, uh, and it's just heartwarming to see this. I have had so many calls, emails from people that wonder what's going on. And uh, I just see it getting better. I th see more, more teachers uh, coming back, more students showing up. And uh, it's heartwarming because we are, in great, we are engaged in great work and uh, we can only, only do it if we're all doing it together. And so thank you for the staff. Uh, uh, thank you for the parents. Thank you for the students. And uh, let's keep doing what we do because we've got a real important job to do. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Otto. Ms. Kerr. No report tonight. Thank you. Mr. Miller. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, first, I just wanted to send out a shout out to Poly High School, I know that they had their Mr. and Mrs. Jackrabbit pageant postponed due to uh, our new protocols and obviously in the uh, midst of this very contagious disease. But I know that they're looking forward to having it later in the year, and I am too. So I, I just wanted to send a shout out to them. Uh, also, uh, in the midst of everything that we're dealing with, we also had to postpone the MLK parade. Uh, this time a year ago, I was talking about how that's my dad's favorite time of the year. Uh, still is. My dad flew out here, uh, prepared to go to the MLK parade, bought his ticket five, six months ago. And so when he came out here and found out it was postponed, he was a little disappointed. He flew back today. But uh, all things considered, that too is, um, from what I was told, is still going to happen. It's still going to be a good time for our uh, high school bands to participate and for us to celebrate some of our athletes, but most importantly, uh, acknowledge uh, all of our civil rights activists, especially uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and all of his hard work that gave us the liberties that we have today. Uh, along uh, those notes, uh, we just finished, uh, we just had our MLK Day. And uh, often we spend 
the day acknowledging both uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's hard work, along with all of the Americans that stood by his side as he fought for civil rights. Um, obviously, there's a number of parallels you can take to his service. And one of them that I like to acknowledge is uh, those edu educators that supported Dr. Martin Luther King and uh, his academic journey. A lot of people don't know about the uh, academic accolades of Dr. Martin Luther King. But uh, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, skipped the ninth grade, he skipped the 12th grade, and had his bachelor's degree by 19 years old. Uh, in college, he was the valedictorian, he was student body president, and graduated with straight A's. And so when we celebrate this man for all of his great accomplishments, I like to think that there are tons of educators and custodians and uh, cafeteria workers that were there supporting him through that process. So um, I know that there were tons of people in his life that are, were looking back smiling. And so as we continue to do this work to support our young people, uh, we too are doing a lot of that work where I like to think that we have future world changers here in our district. And yeah, we have a lot of people doing the hard work, but uh, we too like to think that we got some future doctors, Martin Luther King's and uh, Coretta Scott King's coming through our district as well. So that's all I got. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, and, and in that spirit, you know, over the weekend, um, I, I tried not to spend a lot of time on social media this past weekend, but inevitably you see a lot of MLK Jr. quotes and posts. And I think for me, the underlying uh, really value of, of truly honoring uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is um, what actions we can take based on those values and principles. And so um, the one that really sticks with me tonight, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, is it's, it's always the right time to do the right thing, uh, right? And even during the most difficult uh, times, um, you know, we've had very candid conversations the last couple of weeks with our executive team amongst ourselves uh, here with our principals with our teachers with our staff and it has been a tough really tough start to 2022 um i apologize to uh, i think literally the hundreds of parents and staff and and teachers and community members that have reached out to me via email i uh, was just overwhelmed and could not respond to every single one of those emails um and or the many, many uh, text messages also that I received, but uh, I just want to acknowledge that I share the concerns in our communities, in our schools. I um, acknowledge and understand the frustrations and the fears. Um, many, many uh, folks have reached out and, and really asking us to do more, uh, right? Concerned about us not f feeling like we're not doing enough um, I've heard from teachers and staff and principals and that first week back I shared with Dr. Baker that I had a chance to go out to five schools uh, in my area and I saw amidst the frustrations and the fears and the concerns uh, folks really stepping up and doing their very best to cover classes, to cover lunch and recess, uh, to cover the morning welcomes uh, in the morning. Uh, in the midst of folks, for good reason, being absent, right? We're asking folks to stay home if they're not feeling well, if they're sick. They did, so I want to thank folks for staying home. But at the same time, it, it was clear that um, we could not perform at the quality that we expect of ourselves. But I want to give a special shout out to even our executive staff. All hands were on deck uh, the last few weeks. Uh, I, I would ask our community members, uh, everyone at our school sites and here at our, at our, in our district offices to please continue upholding our safety and health protocols and measures. They work. Um, the science proves that they work. Uh, but in spite of that, we are in the middle of a surge uh, here. And although there is always room for improvement and I share that we could be doing more, uh, we very quickly mobilized 
Dr. Baker shared with me the extra work that went into, I won't mention her by name because I don't want to embarrass her, Susan, uh, just <laughs> securing a million masks for our district um, and setting up that very important clinic at Cabrillo, right? And working with community partners to set up other um, health services at our respective schools. And again, there's always room and opportunity to do more, uh, but a lot has been done in two weeks given the day-to-day -day changes at the state level, at the county level, and then with our local uh, health officials uh, here. So I, I just want to keep reiterating that we need to continue to not just be mindful. Yes, we could do more. Yes, there are, there's room for improvement. Yes, there is a basis for frustration, but people are doing their very best in a very difficult time. Um, in that spirit, I also want to thank parents that have shown grace and patience. Uh, so appreciate folks reaching out, you know, with their concerns. Uh, but, you know, parents have also been thankful. Um, and parents have also stepped up to, to make sure um, that we are also policing each other, all right, so that if we, we can do better, you know, parents have been calling other parents out. Um, and that's a good thing uh, for our community. Uh, it is a difficult time. We understand it's a difficult time. And we understand also that our school system is not a health system. And it was never intended to be a health system. But in the last two years, we have become a de facto health services provider. Our number one mission still is to provide the highest quality public education to our students. And in the midst of these very difficult last two weeks, and it's not to take away from the previous 19 months, people really did rise up to the occasion. Um, I, I want to continue encouraging parents that even though I was not able to individually respond, and I know our staff has been in a good way bombarded with concerns and frustrations, that there are many, many, many actions, discussions, strategy sessions that take place in between board meetings, all right? So just because you're not hearing all this information at a board meeting, a lot of communication went out this week. Um, again, maybe, maybe we could do more, maybe we could figure out a better way of more strategic communications, but communication did go out. The frustrating part is literally from one day to another, there's new updates in communication. So if you got a text or an email or heard from a fellow parent or staff member one thing on Monday, Wednesday, there could have been something different uh, there. So we do have a very updated website. One of the things that I want to encourage folks is there's a FAQ on there. There's links to other resources, to plans, to COVID hotlines, to safety protocols. Uh, even today, uh, there was la the latest information that I was not uh, aware of. And I'm both a parent, a school board member, uh, and I'm here. Uh, present. So I would encourage for many of the folks that are reaching out to us, in addition to reach out to us, to please keep checking our very updated, latest updates. Um, uh, and, and, and again, it's not an end-all, be-all, uh, but it is a good point of information for us and, and, and share on social media uh, as well to our community members. So again, um, I, I want to thank our parents, our teachers, our staff, our executive staff, but most importantly for me, our students, right? Because our students are there grinding it out every day in the most unusual, challenging of circumstances. Um, from our littles all the way through to our graduating seniors and adults uh, in school, uh, I think uh, you know, and I'm guilty of this, we, we sometimes lose sight that at the end of the day, we have not stopped providing an education to our students. And to your point, Mr. Miller, I still truly believe in our public education as being the great equalizer, even during the most challenging time, particularly for our most vulnerable, historically marginalized, disenfranchised communities and students. And we are still here delivering uh, that education not taking away from 
areas we can improve, things we could do better, but literally we are operating day to day in the most unusual and challenging of times. Uh, so I, I, again, I want to acknowledge that it is important for folks to continue to guide our decision making, for us to actively be listening and informing our, our discussions based on that. Please keep sharing concerns, but at the same time, please realize uh, that we nor any system could not have prepared nor have been equipped uh, to be able to address all the daily, weekly, and monthly challenges that we're facing. So if my colleagues are okay with it, I'd, I'd love to just give an applause to all of our staff, all of our teachers, all of our educators for really just stepping up these last two weeks. And it's not uh, from an apologist perspective. I'm not saying things did not go uh, wrong. I'm not saying we cannot do better, but uh, we are here and it seems like uh, things are slightly better this week, uh, right? So let's keep that trend uh, going. Uh, that's my report for tonight. Superintendent's report. Thank you, and thank you for what you shared. I checked several things off my list with the gratitude that you expressed both for staff and for community. So thank you for those acknowledgements. I'm just gonna add on a couple of things, Dr. Benitez. One is um, related to rapid tests that are going home with every student. So for anyone listening that wasn't aware, our students are bringing home the state rapid tests that were delivered last week. And in addition to that, we'll continue to pri provide rapid tests that were ordered by the school district on an ongoing basis. And then I, I'd like to acknowledge, and you said it, we are not a health agency, as you said, Dr. Benitez. So in this moment, I want to acknowledge Long Beach Health and Human Services. They are an important part of getting through a pandemic to us. In the first week of opening a specialized clinic for staff and students at Cabrillo High School, they tested approximately 5,000 adults and students um, who were there, Some, many of whom were experiencing symptoms, and that is a means for helping us keep our community and our schools safe. In addition to those tests, they stayed open for our staff and our students on MLK holiday, which enabled staff and students who were not in school on that day to be tested. They also held for our staff a booster clinic, so almost 150 of our employees were able to access a booster vaccine last Friday, and that clinic will continue for several weeks into the future. So they are a health organization. They have an epidemiologist and a health director who guides the health of this community, and we're grateful for the work that they do and their specific support to Long Beach Unified School District. So reminder, in addition to those tests on the website that you named, Dr. Benitez, there are links to videos that families can watch on how to use the tests that are being sent home, and you can watch them as many times as you want to to guide the use of the rapid tests that are to um, see if your student has symptoms um, while they are at home. And I'm just going to interject, yep. Dr. Baker. So it's lbschools.net forward slash dot uh, net, I'm sorry, forward slash coronavirus is where we'll find all those yes. resources. And if you get to the front page and you forget that, there's a red bar at the mm -hmm. top that you can click on and get to that information. Thank you. I, I will share on a really positive note in the spirit of talking about students and service. Today I spent time on the Wilson High School campus and before I left, um, I was in Mr. Oscar Herrera's classroom. Some of you may recognize that name because he was our senior translator in Long Beach Unified School District before he went into teaching. He now teaches a, a number of Spanish classes and a translation class. He introduced me to a student, Melissa, who um, was one of the founders of a club called Hermanos Unidos at Wilson High School. This club has existed for a couple of years and during the pandemic, they connected themselves as model, role models and service and tutoring for students younger than they are, starting with fourth and fifth graders. Now they serve fourth and fifth and sixth graders. They also, as I heard Melissa tell the story so proudly, they've also connected with university organizations that have a similar function across some of the Cal State system. And so now we're seeing generations of students connect in service to one another. And so um, I was gonna pass on to Mr. Itson, who's probably listening as well. Oscar Herrera and Melissa have a story to tell. And so I hope that we'll hear more about them. So I'll end with that. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Any announcements, colleagues? 
So just two quick announcements. Um, in the spirit of talking about COVID tests, um, you may know that at covidtest.gov, anybody with a residential address can go on and click a button. It's a pretty clear website and order for COVID tests to have in your home to have peace of mind or to check. Um, so as we have them at the school as well, um, order yours today for your household. And also this morning, I ran into Dr. Brown in the most unexpected place. Um, Trader Joe's? No, actually, <laughs> the American Red Cross. So I was donating blood on behalf of the Century Club and Long Beach State um, and Long Beach City College. We're doing kind of a joint blood drive, and there I am, and in walks Dr. Brown in what's been, you know, a lot of weeks of service to people, and there she was again, giving, 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 um, but overhearing the staff talk about what a critical shortage we have in blood right now. Um, that hospitals stop procedures, they stop taking patients if they run out of blood. So if you have the opportunity and you are eligible, I would encourage you to please go give blood. Any other announcements? So I'll do a couple plugs. There are still many opportunities to stay engaged with our district. Um, last, this month, uh, for instance, CAC meeting uh, still went on. Uh, our DLAC meeting is still going on. Our educational opportunities for Native American meetings are still going on. Um, and we will push back the dates on our community visioning and listening sessions, but we will still uh, schedule that. So for more information to come, but there are still many, many, many ways. PTA virtual meetings are still going on. School site council meetings are still going on. So please, uh, there are still many opportunities to engage with our schools and our district. Thank you. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Okay, our next meeting is Wednesday, February 2nd, 2022. Have a good night, everyone, and stay safe.